I'd now like to call up your Westchester County Executive, George Latimer. Thank you very much. It's a uh, blessing to be here with all of you and uh, all of us coming from a different place. Those who are family members of those that were lost that day and that pain that still exists with you to this day and always will. To the first responders, those who worked on the pile and are now seeing what the accumulative impact of your sacrifice is, as Matt and Peter Woods and others will, will talk about in just a second. The veterans amongst us who are here who served your country in time of war and in time of peace and for whose gratitude we continue to express the men and women of government, those who were department heads and commissioners in this government, many of whom were there before I got here, and many of whom are going to be here long after I'm gone, but who are committed to the people of Westchester far more than to a particular leader of the government at any one point in time. To the people who are here uh, in elected positions, my colleagues and friends who serve in the state legislature, led by our state senate ma majority leader, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, and Shelley Mayer and Assemblyman David Buckwald, the members of the county legislature under the leadership of Ben Boykin and their service as a co-equal branch of government, the members of the clergy, the members of the media who are here, the current first responders, the police and firefighters and the EMS people. All of us are here from some different path, but we are all here together today. Let me talk first about today, and then let me talk about that day. Today, being here, I attribute in this location at Kensico Dam in a few minutes to go to the, this beautiful sculpture behind me, the rising, and to see the names of the uh, 123 names we're going to read, 110 uh, on, on the statue. I attribute that to the vision of an individual. It took a lot of people to make it happen, but it took the vision of an individual to see that it would come to pass. On 9-11, he was our county executive, and I know because I was the county chair of the Board of Legislators. And I went up to the ninth floor, and I saw just what he had to do as a county executive, never knowing that I'd have that opportunity in the future. But Andy Spano's vision helped create this monument and this permanent recognition. Andy, please stand for the applause of a grateful county. We have now taken on the task in, in this generation to honor those individuals who have served and are now suffering from that service in the period of time after the towers collapsed, the pile and thereafter, and the health issues that have followed. We have, uh, by our current count, 21 individuals from Westchester County who have died from 9-11 related diseases. Men, women cut down before their time, before they had the opportunity to have a full and complete life because they went into a situation that nobody could calculate and still gave service to their nation. And with the help of people like Matt and Peter and the committee, we will design a suitable remembrance for them so that years from now, 18 years from today, those individuals will be recognized and never forgotten, those Westchester residents who also made this great sacrifice. To be here today is difficult for those because we saw what happened that day. This is not a distant memory to us. I've often thought as I've traveled, I lived outside of Philadelphia many years ago, I had the chance to go to the Valley Forge National uh, Historical Park. And at various times in my life, I've been elsewhere in Pennsylvania, in Gettysburg. And when you see Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, you know the history of what George Washington did and how he held the Continental Army together long enough to get us our independence in that Pennsylvania city. 100 miles or so to the west, when you tour Gettysburg, you see what happened in the great civil war between sections of this country and how this country developed, as Lincoln said, as a new birth of freedom coming out of that terrible conflict. And you see the monuments in that Pennsylvania town. Another hundred miles west of that, there's a monument to an airplane that crashed in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That's the memory that we lived. And it means something different and deeper to us. But if we don't make these memorials, how will young people know? How will they understand what happened that day, the loss of that day, what it meant on that September 11th in 2001? So we create things that are dramatic, breathtaking even, so that we won't forget. And we have a visual remembrance of it, 
so that when this generation of Americans are gone, the next generations of Americans, the next generation of Westchester people will remember that once there was this moment in time and the people that made the sacrifice in that moment in time. And that is our obligation to make sure that memorial happens. Let me speak of that other day that happened 18 years ago. When I think of 9-11, I think of it in the context of a conversation I had with my dad when I was 12 or 13 years old. I uh, did my homework on the dining room table in the middle of our tiny little house on the south side of Mount Vernon. And my algebra teacher, Rayella B. Healy, gave us a quiz every Friday in algebra. I wasn't particularly good at algebra. And I had to study every Thursday night before the Friday quiz. And I hated it. Friday is almost Saturday and Sunday. If you can remember in your day, Friday, Thursday night, you could almost taste the weekend. The last thing you wanted to do was study algebra. And so like any self-respecting 12 or 13 year old, I moped. I sat at the kitchen table with my head in my hands complaining, I have to take a test every Friday, I have to study every Friday. My father, who was a head of maintenance, Beach Point Club in Mamaroneck, he worked by the sweat of his brow, the strength of his arms, walked in and looked at me. He never hit me, but boy, I thought he was gonna. He slammed his hand on the table and he looked at me and said, tested every week. He said, son, when you're a man, you're gonna be tested every day. Study, learn that. I got my B in algebra, <laughs> barely. But my father's words I've never forgotten, that you're tested every day. And you're tested when you're not expected. It's not the LSAT for my friends in law or the board, the, the law boards that you sit for. It's not the test that you get when you and your spouse bring a new life into the world and you look at this baby and you say, oh my God, we have to raise this child. It's crying, what do I do? That's a test. The first time you're, you're bone tired and you have a long distance to drive at night and you're testing your skill behind the wheel of the car to make sure that you can make it through all that distance. There's so many different ways we're tested. But we know and we'll rely on the father and the, the reverend and the imam and the rabbi to help us through these moments. That there is an ultimate test that every one of us here today will face. We will face it. And that comes at the end of days. We don't know how it will come, and we don't know when it will come. We all hope we will be in our late ages, late 90s, early 100s, peacefully passing on, no pain, all of our family surrounding us, and a chance to assess a, well li a life well lived. The people that we lost on 9-11 had the same aspiration we did. They didn't know that by going to work at Cantor Fitzgerald or Aon, by being at the window on the worlds for a breakfast meeting or an early conversation in an office in one of the towers, or for that matter in the Pentagon, they didn't know when they boarded that plane in Boston and Flight 11 bound for San Francisco where they would wind up. And you take that and you personalize it into yourself. I spent a number of years as a corporate executive before I went into this line of work. And I was on many a plane in my 30s and 40s with notes prepared for a business meeting or a client presentation somewhere else in the country. I try to imagine what it would be like for a person sitting across the aisle and seeing some commotion and the person across the aisle to say, hey, fella, are you with us? We've got to storm, we've got to storm that cockpit. Somebody in there is going to crash this airplane. And, and you look up from your notes and you say, what? I'm, you know, I'm not trained to do these things. And then you realize what's happening. And at that moment, you're tested. At that moment. At that moment on the 102nd floor, as you organize your work for the day, one of the innumerable meetings that I put these poor commissioners through that they have to prepare for. And you're with your administrative assistant, and then someone tells you that a plane has crashed into the building. And as you race for exits, you realize there are no exits. There's no way to get out. And you look at each other and you realize this is the test you never thought would come. It's arrived. And it's facing you. First responders are trained every day to put their lives on the line to protect us and our property. 
and the first responders that day were prepared to do what was necessary. When those firefighters walked up the stairs to get people to come down those stairs with 60 pound packs on their back, they knew they were walking into a dangerous situation, but they wanted to live as much as any of us did. But they put that at risk, and the police and the EMS officers as well. That test is what our relatives faced that day. That test is what those names on that wall face this day. There were human beings just like us, no different. I don't know who was a Democrat or Republican. I don't know who was fat or thin. I don't know who was tall or short. They're humans, just like us. And they face the tests that we, we hope we never face. So my theology teaches me that they're at peace. It teaches me that they're in the hands of paradise, whatever paradise is. I have to believe that. You have to believe that. We cannot believe that the evil that was done that day is the final word. We have to believe that this day of voluntary service is there to change the narrative of 9-11. We have to believe that as we came together right after that day, Peter Wood said this this morning in Hartsdale, as we came together right after that, we can find our way back to that again in this country. The unity that we had in the weeks, in the month or two after 9-11. Because at the end of the day, we're really all alike. The old ones of us and the young ones of us, the men and the women, whatever we are, we're all alike. We all face that test. And we all have to remember when people do brave things, when they go above and beyond what you expect a human being to do, then we ought to remember those people forever. And that is what we're doing today here. We're remembering those people forever.